All right, I'm just here really quickly to just talk about Well Played for those of you that it's a new concept. The whole idea is doing a deep dive into what makes a video game tick and how it works and what makes games work well, what can make them work better, you know, and so exploring the value systems around the idea of gameplay mechanics and the unique uh, experience we have when we play a game. And for those of you who saw yesterday, like Ralph was our first attempt at something outside of the realm of games, trying to dive into it, at games for change, but Nick's gonna do a classic sort of deep critique of a game. Uh, that Dragon Cancer Impact, so Nick. Hi everybody. Um, so uh, this is a well played of That Dragon Cancer. My name is Nick Fortino and I'm a co-founder of Playmatics. I've done several of these and I'll get into that in a second. Um, so when Drew asked me to do a well played of That Dragon Cancer, it was kind of weird to me for two reasons. Um, the first is that as a, dem a member of a demographic, I'm not, I think the audience that's the most appropriate for that dragon cancer. I'm a very strong, passionate atheist, and I will probably never have children. So as a 41-year-old atheist with no children and no interest in having children, like it's kind of a weird topic for me. And I was wondering about the game because it has specific religious overtones that I was wondering how I'd respond to. But it's weird for me for a second reason. See, like I'm 41, and so many years ago, I got a bachelor's of arts in literature and philosophy. And during that time, I was engaged in a lot of literary theory practice. And the literary theory that I was drawn to at that time, which was kind of old by the time I got to it, but was still very real, was this idea of new criticism. New criticism was created in 1951, largely by the, book, by the work of this man Ransom in a book called The New Criticism. And effectively, what new criticism was up until the 90s um, was an approach to literature that said that we look at the work independently of other context, other than the reader's context at the time of reading and the work itself. By the 90s, it had been filled with something called reader response theory. You don't have to worry about that. But it's, it's kind of a theoretical kind of approach. And by the way, if you've seen other well plays and you haven't seen ones by me before, I always do forays into theory. So usually I do that somewhere in the middle, and this time I'm doing it up front. Now, let's just, let me just walk through this very quickly. Uh, here's a poem, uh, Ozymandias. You may have, have seen this poem before. You may like this poem. I think the question is, how much do you know about this poem? Like, do you know who wrote it? Well, yeah, Shelley, right? How many of you, don't answer this though, know the story of how this poem was written? written? Like, know the actual history of this poem, right? You probably don't, like almost nobody does. But that actually doesn't affect our appreciation of the poem necessarily. This poem was written you know, over 120 years ago. Uh, so our understanding of this poem is like almost 200 years ago, in fact, and like our understanding of this poem actually is really just informed by us reading it. I don't need to know that much about Shelley to read the poem. I can just understand the poem as I read it, and in fact, that's largely what we do. When I see a movie like The Hurt Locker, I'm not like aware of Catherine Bigelow's background or history. I don't need to know that to appreciate the movie. I can watch the movie, interpret it in the context of my understanding, and appreciate it. Now, that's not to say that biographic information isn't important, and I, there are certainly directors I know biographic information about. Take something like Spike Lee. Like, I understand a lot about Spike Lee because he makes films about his background and his interests. So just by watching the films, I understand it, but I didn't need to research that kind of thing. And that's the critical school that I come from, is the idea that while biographic information can be interesting and can be important and can certainly be valuable to someone, I don't need that biographic information to make sense of an experience. I can make sense out of an experience from reading the experience. And the easiest way to say that out loud is, I shouldn't have to read your placard to understand your art. Like, I should be able to understand your art by looking at the art. And if the art doesn't communicate those things to me from the art, then I don't need to understand it because the reality of a consumer of that art is that they won't necessarily do that. Now, as I understand that in games, that becomes manifested as formalism. Right? I look at the game for the game's qualities, meaning the game's play. Like I think about the game as an experience that I play, and the context of its play, um, in terms of how it was created or who created it, isn't really that relevant to me unless the game wants to speak to that. And if the game wants to speak to that, then that's part of my experience. But if it doesn't, I will evaluate the game independently of that, because the reality of my consumption is that I won't actually see that content. Now, and, I, and, and why this is weird is because like I've presented this way before. If, you, if you've seen any well played by me, you know this, but if you haven't, 
I've talked about the use of ethical decision making and the relationship to morality in Papers, Please. I've talked about the role of the magic circle and how the magic circle creates ritual in Johann Sebastian Joust. And I've talked about the relationship between excellent narrative and flawed gameplay in Cart Life. Um, and so I've, I've focused on kind of a formalist approach. Now, for someone who's talking about formalism and claims to be a formalist, I just told you a ton about my biography, which would seem contradictory to you. Um, but the reason why I'm doing that because, is because I think it's impossible to talk about that dragon cancer without talking about biography, um, largely because of the way it's been presented into the world and the way most people have consumed it. And so I'm going to do this in two parts. I'm going to talk about this game with the biography, um, which is not normally how I critique things, but I think is essential to critiquing this game. And then I'm going to talk about it formally, like using the formalism that I use to critique games on a typical basis. And I think through those two lenses, we can come to an understanding of That Dragon Cancer and how it relates to where we are. Um, now, if you know That Dragon Cancer and you're like most people, you probably haven't actually played it because not that many people have actually played That Dragon Cancer. You probably know it from a couple of different sources. There was a documentary about it called Thank You for Playing that received a lot of attention and was sponsored by Tribeca Film Festival and Hot Docs. There was a Radio Lab piece that analyzed it. You may have seen a trailer about it. And in my informal polling, as I did in preparation for this over the last couple months, almost everyone I knew who knew about this game knew about it from sources like this. And they hadn't actually experienced the game. Um, and so I think that the framing of the game has been essential to the understanding of the game in our time. We can't really look at that dragon cancer without understanding what the story is. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the story, I don't really feel like I have to spend a lot of time talking about this because it is so well known. But basically, That Dragon Cancer is the story of the Green family, of Ryan and Amy Green's experience with their son, Joel, who was diagnosed at an extremely young age with terminal cancer, cancer that was supposed to allow him to only survive for two months, but actually he survived for several years. And the game documents their experience living with Joel with this illness, their experience of trying to treat the illness, and eventually Joel's death. Um, now, when Ryan Green, who li is listed as the designer of the game, Amy is listed as a writer on the game, um, talks about the design of this game, he describes it as a space for him to talk about his son and for other people to love his son and have the joy that he, I, he has being his father. Right? And so the, the, to me, that articulates to some goals that Ryan Green had in the design of this game. I think of that as a space to memorialize their son. Not that, that, that wasn't the intent at first, because when the game was being developed, Joel was still going through treatment. But to really record the process of being a father to Joel and what that experience was, and not just as a negative experience, but as a whole experience, an experience of joy and an experience of pain, and to find an expression for the grief that the family was feeling as they went through this crisis to the point of loss. Um, and I feel like in, in, in Green's talk about the game, that's, that's clearly where his intent was, was to find vehicles for that. So we can look at the game understanding that, right? And in that sense, there's some things that we can kind of highlight. The first thing is that the game is beautiful. There, there's really just enormous amounts of attention to visual design in the game that's very powerful. In particular, I think one of the decisions that was made and very consciously made was the rendering of the characters as largely without features, but still with characteristics. So they were recognizable, relying on what, what McLeod talks about in, in his understanding of comic works is a level of abstraction that would create empathy. And the game does that very powerfully. Um, and some of these moments are just stunning. Like there are single moments in the game that just are, are kind of breathtaking in terms of their value. And I think it manages to do this without looking like a low res experience, even though it is kind of low poly experience. It doesn't resemble other kinds of low poly experiences that we see in games typically today. And so it creates a kind of visual vocabulary that's quite powerful. And uh, you know, the use of, of text in the game is done in a treatment that's also kind of interesting. Um, this works particularly well because it was a very wise choice in the narrative of this game to make the narrative impressionistic. While the narrative of the game follows the journey of the family through Joel's illness, um, including a move from Colorado to San Francisco for an experimental treatment, including visits in and out of the hospital, the narrative, while it follows it linearly in, linearly in time, does not follow it literally. And a number of the elements in the game don't adhere to reality. They reflect an emotional relationship to the content. 
And so, you know, you'll see these kind of wildly unrealistic scenes that are reflective of the moments in history that they were in. And I think that's very powerful for the narrative because it allows them the freedom to move as they want to move and allows them to bring impressionistic elements into this space. Um, a really clear example of this is the way that cancer is represented by black tendrils and black balls in the background or in the sky that are sort of threatening on the horizon or, or cluttering spaces. Um, and that's never referred to. No character ever notices them or sees them, but they're always present. And I think that's a really nice way of reflecting that reality and sort of giving you access to that reality. Um, the game is generally very well written with one accepted scene, which I won't, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not gonna talk about it, but like one scene kind of trips, but most of it is very well written. It's very well voice acted almost through the whole thing. And much to my happy surprise, um, the treatment of religion in the game is, is not in any way something that as an atheist I found offensive or disturbing. The treatment of religion is really a reflection of their internality, their relationships to faith, and a large central conflict of the game is around um, Ryan and Amy's different opinion of how faith affects what's happening to Joel. Ryan largely falls into despair, trying to figure out why this has been allowed to happen and leading to questions about what this relationship is and what the point of it is, why God has made this happen, while Amy holds on to a faith that, that, that God will save her child. Even though she recognizes that that's not likely to happen, she needs that to keep moving. And that tension is one of the central character tensions of the work, and at the center of the piece is a moment where they confront that between them. And that treatment of faith humanizes faith in a way that even as someone who is a non-believer, I could empathize with and I could find power in. And so that's great. And the, the, probably the most powerful scene in the game, um, the scene that certainly moved me the most, is the scene in which uh, Ryan and Amy are in the doctor's office hearing that the treatment that Joel is undergoing has, has led to a relapse of the cancer. And when the scene is introduced to you, it, you cut to the moment where they're sitting in the room, Joel is present, but not very aware because Joel is not generally very aware of the circumstances around him. And the doctors are explaining that there's been a, a, a recurrence of the cancer. And while to you, that doesn't sound very harmful, it's revealed in the scene that that recurrence is a sign that the treatment will not work and that in fact, Joel's lifespan is gonna be measured in months. And in the scene, we're allowed to explore the interiority of these characters as we move around in time so that we can see how they are thinking about this and we get the breadth of their expressions and really get a voice to the kind of grief that everyone is feeling, including the doctors and the nurses who have to deliver this news. And in that moment, I feel like I felt the most empathy for what was going on. Um, so in this way, I would argue that towards the goals that I mentioned at the beginning of this, it's, it's very successful. There are moments where I truly can see the experiences that Ryan and Amy had with Joel that were positive, where they were laughing, where they were celebrating together, where they were playing. I got an experience of Joel's reality and I could see how um, grief inflected that. And clearly the time spent in this game, the work in this game and the care in this game demonstrates a reality of, of an expression of grief that they created. So in that sense, I would never tell uh, Ryan or Amy Green that this game failed. I think for what they were trying to do, understanding their intent, this game was successful. But I'm a formalist. And to me, that formalism reflects what games are. And I'm gonna say something kind of quickly in here because I can't just spend my whole half an hour arguing about this, but it's something I feel very deeply and I'm going to say very strongly. Um, games are about interactivity. Like as, as Drew mentioned at the beginning of as in his introduction, like we, we're here to talk about mechanics and the things that make games games. Now that doesn't mean that I'm trying to define what a game is in some deep way or say that there's any kind of things that should and shouldn't be games for our discussion. But what I do wanna say is that interactivity has to be critical to that. Like my ability to interact with the, with the experience has to be a component of that experience. Because if it's not, then I'm not playing a game. I'm watching an animation or I'm watching a movie. Like if my decision making, my interaction, my agency doesn't have some intersecting point, whether it be futile or frustrated or complexified or ambiguous, then I didn't participate in the game because I didn't interact. I'm just watching something. So from that lens, I need to look at the game. And the reason why I need to look at the game that way is because I bought the game on Steam, right? I paid $15 for it in a marketplace of games. 
This game was not sent to me as a personal expression of grief. This game was a, was a marketable product that I picked up. And so in, in its presence in this space, I'm drawn back to the sort of marketplace of art that I think fueled these kind of criticism concerns that I have in the first place, that this is a game. I bought it as a game. It's alongside my Steam library with Life is Strange and Human Resource Machine and, and a bunch of Mirror's Edges, right? Like, like a bunch of different things that have no relationship to it. And so I find myself drawn back to being a game designer and a game critic, and then I want to think about the game from that lens. So what happens when we think about the game from that lens? What happens when we don't look at just the visual design and the writing and the content, but then we actually look at the interactivity of the game? Well, the scene I just described, the scene that I was telling you about, about the doctor's office, where you, know, you hear this news, the interactivity that guides that scene is this. Um, this is a, a riff on a children's toy. People know what this toy is? Um, it's called the, the Farmer Says. Um, and the Farmer Says toy, the way it works, is that you, you have a, this dial, and the dial spins, and you pull the lever, and it lands on an animal, and it makes an animal noise. And so like a little, it's, it's for very young children, and you pull the lever, and it sort of spins, and then it lands on the pig, and it'll say something the farmer says. The pig says, oink, oink, and it goes, oink, oink, and, right? and it's like, we know from games that we design for kids that like that is kind of a rewarding practice, like repetitive activity to stimulus is a very rewarding practice, right? Now, what's interesting about this to me, though, is that that's not how this works. The way that this works is that you use your mouse to set the arrow onto the character you want, and then you set that little dial on the top to the point in time in the scene you're in, although there's no relationship between night and dark in the scene, and then you pull the lever, and then the scene rewinds to the moment in time that you set on the top, and then plays the interiority of the character you clicked. I'm not sure if you followed that. I certainly didn't, because it didn't really make sense to me. It particularly didn't make sense to me because in, in just moments before in the scene, there was an actual The Farmer Says toy that Joel is playing with that I play with like a, like a Farmer Says toy, where I just pull the lever and it makes a random sound. So when I saw this, I figure, oh, I pull the lever and it's gonna, make, it's gonna land on a character and do something random, but it doesn't. It plays on the characters it's on, and it probably took me a couple minutes of just manipulating it to just kind of figure out how it worked. Um, and I still didn't really figure out how it worked because the room started filling with water, and I didn't know why. And while the image of the room filling with water was really interesting, I had no idea what my interactivity was doing in relationship to that. It just sort of happened. So I spent my time kind of resetting it and pulling it, trying to figure out what was going on, and then eventually the room filled with water, and I was out of the scene. And that relationship is the relationship I see over and over again in that Dragon Cancer. Um, there's a racing scene in the middle of the game, but the controls on the, on the car are kind of sluggish, and it moves kind of slow, and I never really feel like I'm moving the way I want to move, and there's pills in the space, but I don't know why they're there, and I get a display at the end of a list of pills that doesn't, isn't really meaningful to me, and I don't know why I got it. Um, there's a really important scene where Ryan is underwater as he's sort of thinking about his despair as his wife remains in a boat trying to move forward. And the narrative of the scene is very clear. She's rowing forward while he's stuck in this moment. But the interactivity is I click and the character struggles a little bit and stops, but I don't know why. Am I facing the wrong direction? Am I not clicking enough? And I click repeatedly for no reason just to try to make that happen. Now, I want to stress here that this is not something where I felt frustrated or helpless. I felt confused. Like I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't understand what was happening. And that I think is really important because I think some of the emotions that a, that a story like That Dragon Cancer is trying to communicate would be feelings of helplessness or frustration. But that wasn't the emotion I felt. This scene, this kind of gorgeous cathedral scene, the interactivity of this scene is that there's a keyboard in front of you that you play. And as you hit keys on the keyboard, prayers of, of, of Ryan and Amy play out as candles light up and, and go out. Now, that may sound very vague, and I'm telling it to you vaguely because that's as much as I understood of what happened. I hit those keys eight to 10 times each. I repeated everything. I tried every pattern I could think of. I timed it to the candles. I tried to figure out how I could keep everything lit up. It never made any sense to me. I just hammered the keyboard over and over again repetitively until the scene finally ended, and I have no idea what my relationship was to that interaction. Right, and what that does is it distances me. Like it pushes me away from the content. Because I go into my gameplay head where I'm trying to understand what my mechanics do and I can't find it. Now, the, the, and that's, I think, the concern I have with that Dragon Cancer is that the interactivity in these moments is either like this, it's sort of confusing and unclear, 
or it's completely directed. I have no agency whatsoever. I'm told to click on something, and I click on it, and it does something. I click on, on Joel as he's on a rocking horse, and Joel rocks. I click on a balloon thing, and I, a, bubble, a bubble blower, and I blow bubbles. I click on a crib, and I walk to the crib. And that kind of interactivity isn't very interesting to me because I have no choice in it at all. I'm just simply clicking to go to the next page. So the interactivity is, becomes kind of transparent. It's like I'm watching a video. I'm just like clicking to make the video go forward. And so I don't engage with that agency either. And so what I find as I play that Dragon Cancer is that it, at every level, the interactivity is either stymieing me through confusion or giving me no choice at all. Now, again, you might say that that was intentional, right? That the idea was to create that kind of feeling, but I don't think a feeling of confusion is what I want. And we've seen games that manage to create a sense of frustration or helplessness or troubled reality through my interactivity. So for example, a game like Problematic by Liz Ryerson is an excellent example of a game where you try to play a platformer and you're constantly stymied in the way and kind of thrown into prison. And Ryerson's game is a commentary on prison culture. And I feel that frustration. I can see things I'm trying to do and I fail to do them repeatedly. So I engage with the system, but then I get pulled back by the system's constant denial of my freedom and my ability to act. Or we could look at a game like Dysphoria, which explores very uncomfortable relationships to one's body and transformations in one's body, and tries to make it clear like what the feelings of those relationships are. And yes, I know this game is really old, and I've probably talked about it like eight times already, but it's that good. And it's that good because the interactions are that good, that I can constantly refer to it as a model for how this interactivity works. So I mean, what do I have to say about that Dragon Cancer at the end? I guess what I want to say about it is that it does succeed in a lot of levels. It's very moving at moments, but the interactivity is just deeply flawed. It falls short of the potential of the piece. There's a beautiful moment in Thank You For Playing where, where Amy and Ryan are looking at the game as they're working out together, and Amy Green says that she, she has this realization that players should have moments where they're having fun, and then they should realize where they are in the process of Joel's life because that's part of the grief process. And I think that is a beautiful intent. I think that that intent would deliver exactly the kind of interactive intent that that Dragon Cancer is trying to. But I never have that moment in that Dragon Cancer because I think the interactivity never rises to the level of intricacy that makes it possible. I have nothing but, 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 but love and condolences for the Green family for their loss. I have nothing but congratulations for their success on trying to express this experience. I think there are parts of this experience that are wonderful. Ryan himself says that there's so much he doesn't know as he's making this game because they're doing something that people don't do, which is make a game about this content. And I believe they should be rewarded for that. We should praise them and respect their bravery for trying to do something like this. It's, it's not an easy thing to do any of the things I described. Um, and I think rightfully so, this game won an award um, for being the most innovative. You know, I, I, like, I, I think my favorite, my favorite moment in Thank You For Playing, like my favorite single moment of Thank You For Playing is Ryan has been asked at some point like why he made this game. And his response is, this is what creative people have always done when faced with the insurmountable. And I think that that, the idea that as, as Ryan Green faced this moment in his life, and I, and I simply cannot imagine something more painful than what he experienced, um, and I, like I said, don't have kids, and I still, I still find myself like just take blown away by the potential pain that this, this could cause and how difficult this must have been and what this process must have been. Um, and that going to a game was the decision that he made because that was an expression of his grief and the expression of the love that he felt is a sign to us that the most serious topics can be covered by games. There is no question to me now that games can represent a range, the range of emotions that we have. And I feel like rewarding that Dragon Cancer with recognition for that is appropriate and good for us to do. But in my mind, it's a flawed experience. Uh, and, I, and I have a hard time saying that the game is great. Now, some of you are going to say this is the wrong critique of this game. Uh, and some of you may be uncomfortable with me talking about the game this way because it's, it is talking about a biography that I know and that we know and that it is speaking to this experience. But I, I, this is why I want to do well plays. This is like what well plays are for for me, right, is having this conversation. 
Other media understand that doing work about serious topics is not in and of itself a, a critical response to be recognized. We can tell stories about disease that are brilliant. We can tell stories about disease that are commercially successful, recognized, powerful works of art. You know, work like Still Alice about Alzheimer's, right? Devastating movie that compels watch massive critical response, commercial success. We can also tell stories about cancer that are small C flops. I don't even know if people remember that movie, <laughs> right? But like we can, we, it's not, the, the fact that this, the movie is about disease to film does not mean that the movie is good, right? It's the implementation of the movie that makes the movie good. How does it treat disease? How does it use filmmaking technique to treat disease? That's what makes it powerful. It's, the content is not going to deliver the message. The implementation delivers the message, right? So how do we do that? You know, and to me, that means, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna take questions in this one until near the end. That means to me that like, it's the implementation we need to be thinking about and talking about. You know, and, I, and I think that as so far as we don't talk about it, we end up potentially making inferior work. So do you want to know the actual history of this poem? Sure. Okay, so uh, Shelley wrote this poem um, as part of a literary circle. Um, he was there with like Keats and Lee Hunt um, and a bunch of other people and they would do these competitions amongst themselves. They were like a bunch of poets together and they would do these competitions where they would come up with something to write a poem about and then they would quickly write a poem and they would publish them together and they would just sort of see which one did better. Right, so they were kind of in critical dialogue with each other. Um, and there were all sorts of like sonnets that they were writing at the time about the Nile. Um, and so Shelley and Smith, uh, Har uh, Harold Smith, picked a quote from a Greek historian that was tied to an Egyptian statue that said, King of Kings, Ozymandias am I. If anyone wants to know how great I am or where I lie, let him outdo me in my work. And the two of them wrote a poem based on that, as a, literally as a competition. They were writing poems against each other to see who would write a better poem, and then they were both published um, like in a, in a magazine by Lee Hunt and sort of put out into the world. And by the way, you can find Smith's poem. It's okay. <laughs> right? It's clearly not this. And that's there's something really inspiring for me about that. Like, here's this community of, of poets like actively working together to challenge each other to write better work, like literally organizing competitions to see who could write better poems, challenging each other to move the form forward. And what do we get for that? We get a poem that we remember hundreds of years later, right? We in fact get a poem, and I think many of you may even know about this poem because it becomes a reference in other work, <laughs> right? So this is the Ozymandias episode of Breaking Bad. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with all this stuff, it's considered maybe the best episode of what is maybe the best television show that's ever been on television, right? Which exists in part because that poem existed. And, right, and, I, and when it, to me, that's what's at stake in what we do, right? If we are going to claim we make art and that we make powerful work and that work has the potential to change people, that's what we're talking about, is work that can last hundreds of years, work that could inspire other work, work that could drive the whole form forward. Those are the conversations that we should be having. And that's why this is such an important thing to me. So, you know, what I think about is that this is the 13th game for change that has existed, right? Like this is the 13th time we've all gathered together to talk about these topics. We're not new, we're not young, we're not fragile, right? We, we're at a place now where we can see the potential of our medium. And I think that creates, a, that puts us at a crossroad. I think we're at kind of an important moment in that. I think this is true of indie games as well too, although I'm not gonna get into that because that's not this conference. Um, because I think we've now proven that games can be made about the most sensitive topics that we have. We've now seen material approaching this and we are able to take it seriously as that material. So I think the question for us is, what is the bar for us now, if that's true? Like, I think we could say that critiquing these games in a way that approaches them formally, that asks about their mechanics, that talks about their play, and challenges them to be better played no matter what their content, um, is not appropriate because of the content. 
and because of the histories and the biographies of the people who are making these things. But I don't think that's what's going to get our best work. And I think we as a community do a disservice to designers if we allow them that, uh, that lack of criticism. I think we do our best work as a, as, as a community when we are focused on implementation, when we, ex we realize that content is important and we want that content to be made, but our drive is to make the best content all the time. And our discussions are going to be competitions to push us to make better and better and better work so that our industry is strong, so that we are strong as individual designers, so that our work is stronger, and so that we can inspire people like forward in time when the story of people like the Greens is obliterated by history. So I'm going to pause for a minute to allow you to throw any eggs or rotten vegetables or rocks that you may have brought into the, into the room. Um, that's, that's what I have to say about this game. Um, thank you for coming. I guess I could take questions because we have a bit of time. <laughs> thank you. OK, yeah, yeah. If we believe that games are capable of covering this content, then we believe that interactivity is capable of covering this content. And if the interactivity in this game was not as successful as it could be and it didn't reach its potential, we believe that interactivity could be that powerful. Oh, yeah, I absolutely believe it. There are works of games about grief. Not many digital games about grief, but there are analog games about grief. There are live action role playing games and tabletop role playing games about grief, specifically designing interactivity to explore grief. Um, and other emotions too that parallel, um, that are parallelly complex and ambivalent emotions. So I, I guess my argument, and this is just me, I'm, I'm purely just speculating at this point, so you can disagree with me as much as you want, but like, I feel like I have every confidence that games can do that. I think looking at a range of experiences that are designed to get away from like the typical experiences games create. I'm looking at Tracy like right now, so I keep thinking Walden, 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 Walden in my head. Um, but like like experiences like that, experiences like dysphoria, experiences like problematic. I mean, I can I can name more if I have a second to think about it. But like I think we've shown a capacity to do those kind of things. But that capacity comes in part from thinking about interactivity and trying to design interactivities that make that possible. Because I think if we say that it's the voices and the the visuals that make that thing work, then we're saying it should have been an animation. And I don't think it should have been an animation. Like, I don't think that's what we, that, that's what this should have been. I think it should have, it, it is a game, and it should be a game, and it's successful to a degree as a game. What I'm arguing is, I think more, more challenge to its interactivity and more drive to its interactivity would make it a better game for that purpose. Yeah. Uh, okay, kind of yeah. Context, which is in my personal experience, I, I've been struggling with this idea of things that are like are like games or are like storytelling or are like other things like interactive books versus things like what there's a blurry area I think could be explored in the industry for a variety of reasons, but I don't know what the default is. So that's why I'm asking. Sure, I think the 
I don't want to get into a big debate about this right now, but I think that the analogy you gave is mixing apples and oranges, because I said that games are about interactivity, and that's a formal statement. It's saying that like what defines a game as a thing is interactivity. I didn't say goal structure. I didn't say fun. I didn't say what the interactivity was for. I didn't even say if the interactivity was effective. I said that interactivity was the difference, because if I didn't interact, then I was watching. And if I'm watching, we have a medium for that. When you mentioned your architecture example, you talked about a purpose for the architecture. It's like to provide shelter. That's, that's a different question. Like The question of what we use architecture for is a valid question, just like the question of what we use games for is a valid question. Just like the question of whether games need to constitute things that involve certain kinds of emotion is a question. But I think we need to have some functional definition of games because as a teacher, I have to teach people how to make games. And if I don't know what I'm telling people to do when I do that, I have no functional technique to teach them. And I feel like the safest, most basic thing I can say is that the difference between a game and an animation is that I do something in a game and I don't do something in an animation. And I feel like if we obliterate that line, that I have no sense of what a definition of a game is anymore. And I, and I, I don't, and I'm happy to have that debate at a future point and you can just like tackle me in the hallway and tell me how, how fascistically formalist I am. But like, uh, I, I, I really don't, I, I don't know how we get around that consideration and I don't know why we want to because like, you will notice I talked about dysphoria, right? Which is an, in, a highly controversial it, like, like property around whether it's a game or not. Um, and that's not really my concern, I don't care. You know, because that, that's not the question. I interact with dysphoria. Like, I have to do things to make dysphoria move forward, and the aesthetic of dysphoria comes out of my interaction, and I think that's, that's a critical thing. So my question actually builds on it. I'm sorry to make things worse, but um, uh, what I have noticed in myself is that there, I, I, I'm with you. In order to teach somebody how to learn the framework of, to understand what it is they're striving for, um, and so to come up with these definitions, these definitions describe us and teach us to learn and what makes us learn. And um, I have been speaking in my mind, never told what that definition is, because I realized that early on, we decided that game was the thing, and there's something that drives us to learn this more than any other type of interactivity once we define what the thing is. If I said that this was heaven, I'd be looking at a different kind of Uh, okay, here's, here's where I'm going to get, like, like, so if you, if you were waiting with your rock, this is the moment, okay? Um, all right. <laughs> so let me say what I actually think, right? Um, I don't think Dysphoria is a game. I don't think that Dragon Cancer is a game. I kind of don't think Gone Home is a game, although I'm not quite sure. And the, the answer you gave is why, right? Like, I think that actually in a strict formalist definition, a game has a set of parameters to it that create an emotional effect and it's kind of like magic, right? It's like it's a, it's a setup that creates that magic. And what we discovered, I think honestly with dysphoria, dysphoria was the first piece that taught me this anyway, was that there was this whole other way of using interactivity that could be extremely powerful emotionally that didn't do anything that games did, right? And I think that I think what's problematic about this is that like games have gotten kind of privileged as a category so that we keep like wanting everything to be in games. And I think that's kind of destructive educationally because then we're basically saying that everything has to have all these tropes of games and what we've learned is they don't actually. We can we can make mechanics that aren't we can make interactions that aren't mechanics, right? And I like your phrasing of that. Like interactions that are metaphors, interactions that are representations, right? And those can be just as powerful. And I think, you know, if we really want, I'm, I'm, I didn't mean to derail like this, I apologize. But like, if you think about interactive documentary, if you think about transmedia work, if you think about places where games aren't that important, but interaction exists, you start seeing this stuff pop up more and more and more again. And I encourage you, if you're interested in this kind of art, look at Welcome to Pine Point, look at Bear 71, you know, look at works from the interactive documentary space that really kind of play with interaction design, because then we find that that's true. So I, what I feel like, I guess, in, in my heart is that games are a manifestation of interaction design that fits into a particular kind of formulaic category. And we need, as, as artists at least, 
to expand beyond games to consider interactions that aren't game-like. I personally don't want to collapse everything into game because I think it leads to exactly what you're describing. Then we get these tensions around winning and losing, and we get these tensions around challenge, and we get these tensions around, and, and the word fun is already so problematized, but then it gets even worse, right? Like, I think, why don't we, why don't we accept the reality of what dysphoria and games like dysphoria and games like, like um, That Dragon Cancer do, which is that they're not intended to be structured like games and elicit the kind of arc of experience that games create. They're intended to do something else with interactivity. And that can be very powerful and very good. And we should be modeling that and teaching people how to do it and coaching them to do it. But let's stop calling them mechanics and games when we do that. Because in, insofar as we do, we drag them back into a vocabulary that they can borrow from, but they're ultimately not part of. Yeah, so detente. <laughs> Cool, I like that, Tracy. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Um, towards the end of his life, Edgar Joyce wrote a novel that um, defies practically every definition of what a novel is considered a great novel. But from your formalist uh, standpoint, if you could comment on why your resistance to cheese shit paradigm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, oh, r yeah, River Run, oh, damn, I used to know it's River Run past Swerve of Shore to Bend to Bay leads us back, damn it, I can't remember the rest of the line. We're talking about Finnegan's Wake. Um, uh, commodious thicket of recirculation. Yeah, 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 I, 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 I'm, it's gone, I used to know this, I studied Joyce a lot. Um, yeah, okay, so yeah, so like Joyce blows up novel, crazy, crazy blows up novel, does everything different, you know what, it's in a, it's in a, it's in paper? Right, and it's got words, and I read it. So there's a level of the formalism of Joyce that didn't reduce away from the complexity of the work, right? And I feel like that modernism is what we should really, okay, yeah, boy, you're just like, like letting me talk about all these rants I wanna get out. Um, <laughs> modernism is what we should be talking about. Like modernism is, is where we should be right now. Like that's what I think, that's where I think the games, the indie games industry in a way is, is like, like, if you look at modernism in literature, what was it? Radical experimentation of form. Let's just blow it all up, right? That in its final manifestation hit the ulipo, where like, we did, we, not only did we just blow up like sort of basic ideas of books, we just structurally started to tear books apart, right? So that we got books where like you swap pages around, or books where you tore the pages up, or books that were made by computers, which Calvino started thinking about in like the, I don't even remember when it was, late 60s or something. Like, like, it's, it's, it, like it really went crazy, but there's a fundamental relationship I still have to the work, which is I read something, right? That's my understanding. And that's like the ground I think I wanna talk about. Now, blow it all up above that, right? Go crazy, like show me whole new ways to read. But if I'm reading, that's a basic relationship to a user that I want to understand. Because all of the exploitation that Joyce does comes from reading and like the understanding of what a reader does. So I think that as we look at experimentations with literature that came afterwards, and that's really what I, frankly, that's like what I really know is like post-war American experimentation with literature. So right, you look at Pynchon, you look at, you look at Nabokov, you look at um, like more modern work like How to Be Both or, um, a girl is a half-formed thing. You like start exploring the works that really just like, go like you know like how to how to maintain your Volkswagen like crazy cra like you want to read some crazy books? There you go. Gave you a list of crazy books. Um, you know like like you, they they really exploit like what language can do and how language forms and how we use metaphor in like a broad way. But you still read them. Like my basic relationship is as a reader, right? And I think that's. That's how we build, that's how formalism understands this work. And that, and that way I think formalism actually gives us a lot of freedom because if we think about it in those really base abstract ways, we have the freedom to build up from that and build up and build up and build up into the strangest possible structures.
Uh, no, I, I agree with everything you just said. I'm just saying, like, why don't we draw the game line here, right? And then just keep going with experimentation. But like, let's just say a game is this thing, so we can teach people how to make games, and that we can make better games. And then over here, we'll find other models, and then we'll just align around those models, right? And then we'll have a different model, which is kind of happening already, right? Like, you know, if, if you really want to push it, it's like, what did Dear Esther do? Dear Esther sort of pointed a way towards a whole other kind of what we might call genre that we're now building out in all these different forms. And so you have Firewatch, and you have Gone Home, and you have other games that are sort of spilling out of that space. That's going to develop its own tropes. That's going to develop its own metaphors. It's going to become a reliable, consistent reality, right? But if it's not using games, why are we talking about games anymore? Let's just leave games behind and call it what it is. And then we can make better works there. We can re-dissect its formalism. We can find the abstractions that make it possible. We can build up from that to a million other works. And we're not beholden to the pressures of games to make games real. I, the last thing on earth that I want to do as a teacher, as a designer of games and other interactive experiences that I wouldn't call games, um, as a critic, is have people stop doing that experimentation. I just would like us to think a little bit about what that experimentation actually is and be true to its formal roots as we do it so that we can make better works of that kind as we develop them. And I think that comes most importantly when we realize that like whether we call something a game or not is not a value judgment on the property. Just like if I say that King Lear isn't a painting, I didn't insult King Lear, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm just saying that like, the techniques of making a play are not the techniques of making a painting. And I think the sooner we understand as instructors that we're talking about different things and that we can kind of develop a critical vocabulary around the things that we're actually making, the more equipped we will be to instruct students and ourselves make better works in that space. That's, that's where you can keep yelling at me. <laughs> if you want to keep yelling at me, thank you very much.